The McLean County Regional Planning Commission is out with a draft of its new regional housing recovery plan, and it's not just about more developments. We should also think about maintaining, preserving existing stock. Commission Director Ray Lai, just ahead on WGLT Sound Ideas. Good evening, I'm John Norton. On today's show, you'll also hear what painting means to a retired college professor from Normal. What it gives me is a sense of of a connection to what's around me, to nature, and to uh, life. Tom Clemens is showing tonight the McLean County Arts Center, plus a preview of WGLT's new Women's History Month series, 21 Women Who Shaped Bloomington Normal. Those stories follow a Bloomington Normal News update just ahead. This is Sound Ideas on 89.1 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR Network. Support for WGLT comes from Bloomington Normal Audiology. Hear My Story continues with local patient Paul Brandt. Honestly, I appreciate working with BNA. I, I would just say that I appreciate all the tough times with me, patience uh, and, and persistence with me. Paul's full story can be found at bnaudiology.com. From the campus of Illinois State University in Normal, this is WGLT's News Magazine Sound Ideas. I'm John Norton. Thanks for listening on this Friday. The McLean County Regional Planning Commission has released a draft of its regional housing recovery plan for public comment that's supposed to draw a roadmap for Bloomington Normal and the region to address housing shortages and housing needs of specific groups of people. The plan notes there is limited affordability, not much choice for young professionals or seniors, not much housing diversity, barriers to access for low-income people, and rising homeless and poverty rates. The poverty rate for African Americans is also much higher than for the population as a whole. In this conversation with WGLT's Charlie Schlenker, Regional Planning Commission Director Ray Lai lays out some of the recommendations to address the tangle of issues that affect housing. There's some current programs, you know, that should be looked at and considered. And one of the recommendations from this plan is, you know, to have some kind of regional information hub so that with certain populations, certain needs, you know, those information will be made available and that there will be, we work with organizations and nonprofits and including currently the housing uh, navigator out of MCCA, uh, but that's only with like a limited time thing. It's like funded for two years. So if there's opportunity to extend that, uh, whether it's from municipal f- funding or other sources of funding, because there's definitely need for functions and services provided by that. So there's a lot of different ways you know that we can help people with special needs and depending on their situation. Uh, although it may not be on an individual basis, uh, but then they will make sure there's information available and then we can target to certain groups of population. One of the the populations that's that's rising is is the unhoused or the homeless. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are the recommendations in the report to address that constituency? Mm-hmm. This report doesn't address like specifically, but there's some recommendations that would be relevant, uh, such as the resources that could be available uh, with the state, because they have an office of homeless prevention, and uh, we are working with that, that office, our the governor's office, uh, on looking at some of the solutions. Uh, then we are, uh, as part of the recommendations, there will be a lot of regional resources that will be hoping to coordinate and see if what resources are out there that would help the unhoused or the homeless folks that currently experiencing or trying to prevent that you know getting worse one of the lacks identified in the report and recommendations is is that the community consider increasing the amount of permanent supportive housing for the homeless mm-hmm. what went into that recommendation we recognize what we call the, like you said, the uh, the PSH, the permanent supportive housing, and for the uh, audience, it's just not getting them a place to to stay or permanently or temporarily transitioning to more permanent location, but then to provide larger support services. So right now, there's not enough of those type of developments or housing units. So this is one of 
the goals of the plan is to increase the number of uh, units of those type of uh, development, uh, the PSH development in our community. Just like any other residential development, market rate or not market rate, the affordable housing, uh, it takes a lot of effort. And I recognize there are some nonprofits in our community going after your state funding as in subsidies uh, for those type of units. But we also will encourage, and actually we explore different opportunities. If there are developers outside of this area who are experienced in providing uh, those permanent supportive housing units, you know, we're trying to work with them, try to attract them, try to get them to get knowledgeable our community and then uh, to work with them. What are some of the other recommendations you want the public to, to look over before you finalize the report? Yeah, it really have a wide range uh, from having an implementation committee set up to have like regional resources uh, that we collaborate with, to have like a more centralized information hub, to uh, having a what we call housing coordinator. It, it takes actually more than one person full time job to to help to promote to to have to implement all the recommendations. But we believe there's definitely a need for at least as a start to have a, like a full time person a look at these recommendations to help to implement those in working with different partners. And on top of that, uh, education, public education, because housing is, it could mean different things to different folks. A host other recommendations also, including reviewing the zoning ordinance, see if, because that would affect the land use and approval of development proposals, um, and also to maximize and expand any funding opportunities, you know, from looking at federal, state, even local, even for the uh foundations, just the whole host of funding opportunities. And it's not just to add new developments. We should also think about maintaining, preserving existing stocks to a good uh, housing quality and also to support any, you know, what we uh, just said earlier about the PSH, the Permanent Supportive Housing, and LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit uh, programs and, and developers who are so interested. Um, and landlord is in other sector that in employers, we recognize there are a few major employers in town, uh, let alone smaller ones, but employees do encounter housing needs and, and issues. So by working with landlords and, and employers in our community, it would help to alleviate or to prevent or to work collaboratively uh, with them so to help their own employees and, and that will be a good economic development, if anything else, in terms of workforce retention. Where should some of this coordinating behavior be housed? Should it be housed in the Regional Planning Commission? Should it be housed in one of the municipalities or at the county level? What What's the best fit to make sure it's effective and actually does the job of bringing stakeholders together? That's a very good question. Uh, in fact, we start looking at some of the, the best practices. There are a lot of housing plans out there, but what is the model that's most effective, right? And what is this should be governmental only? Uh, so that it be intergovernmental and also it involve like uh, private sector and nonprofits who also on the different uh, uh, segments of the formula, you know, to 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 make housing work in an equitable, in an affordable manner. That is something we're considering while this is a regional issue and whether MCLPC, um, McLean County Regional Planning Commission should be the one coordinating that. We don't have a lot of bandwidth because we're pretty loaded uh, in terms of projects and workload, but we definitely would be interested in just seeing what was the best practices and then would help to coordinate, at least in the beginning, to form an implementation committee to get this going. That's Ray Lai, director of the McLean County Regional Planning Commission. The commission wants community feedback on the plan by March 14th to allow the commission to finish the plan by the end of the month. You can read the plan and comment at mcplan.org. Ray Lai spoke with WGLT's Charlie Schlenker.
stories and conversations around Bloomington Normal and McLean County. This is WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. March is Women's History Month, and every weekday on WGLT, you will hear a new episode of a series we're calling 21 Women Who Shaped Bloomington Normal. You may have already heard the first episode today about Eva Jones. She was the first black person to serve on the District 87 School Board and the Bloomington City Council. And that's just the first line of her remarkable resume. WGLT's Ryan Denham is in studio to tell us a little bit more about this series. Ryan, thanks for stopping in. Hey, John. Let's start with 21 women who shaped Bloomington normal. Let me show you how did that. Okay. So, 21 women who shaped Bloomington normal. How did WGLT select these 21 women? So, it started with uh, nominations from the community. Uh, in December, we put a call out and asked people to nominate those who they felt had shaped the community in some positive way. We got about a, over 130 nominations from the community uh, that we waded through. Our newsroom got together uh, and had a very lengthy uh, meeting uh, one day to talk about, uh, to try to whittle, the, whittle that list down to, to the final 21. I mean, some people got multiple nominations, too. I mean, one person got nine just, just on her own. And we voted and we voted. We voted again, kind of like a jury. And eventually we landed on, on 21. Can you tell us who's on the list? I can't. It's a secret. But you can follow along the series uh, over the course of the month. We'll release... One new story, one new name every day. It, it is a mix of, of political figures, um, educators, judges, community advocates, artists, coaches. Um, so, some of these people have passed away. They're, they're older historical figures. Others are still very active in the community. Some are names you will definitely like recognize, and others are going to be surprising. But they share this one thing, which is you know, without them, this is a very different community. And so we're excited to kind of reveal these names one by one over the course of the month. It sounds like intentional. You wanted to make this as much current as it was historical. I think there was a slight emphasis, yes, on sort of living history, those who are still with us and and can speak to their story a little bit themselves. Okay. Um, Why just 21? Well, yeah, I mean, easily we could have done uh, 42 or uh, 63 or 84 women, uh, given how many stories there are to tell. But there are 21 weekdays in March. Uh, which is Women's History Month. On the weekends, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to be featuring a bunch of these stories throughout each weekend day, so new audiences can hear them. Uh, And then every week on Sound Ideas, uh, you'll hear extended versions of these women's stories. But given all that, 21 people, that means a lot of really deserving figures were left off the list. Of course, a list like this is imperfect, right? It's it's developed and created by humans, and, and we are imperfect, so... It should be clear that this is not a ranking. We're not ranking most impactful to the community, anything like that. We're not releasing them in any particular order. And mostly what it is is maybe this is all kind of a clue that we should do this again in 2025 and do another 21 people. Well, obviously, it's it's Women's History Month in March, which is a good tie-in to do this. But if I'm reading you right, there's a little bit more behind this than it just it's, quote, Women's History Month. Yeah, I mean, in terms of why we, why we did it, um, this particular series, I'm not going to speak for the whole newsroom because I think each person will have their own sort of interests and motivations. But for me personally, what, what it was was, you know, following the news every day, it is a lot of <laughs> coverage of gridlock, uh, problems that haven't been solved, institutions that are struggling, policymakers who, who can't get things done. Um, so personally, I find it useful to remind myself Sometimes, it, yeah, we are capable of some pretty amazing things. I mean, locally, we have addressed complex problems. We have done politically complicated things. We have found ways to make this a more welcoming place to live, even when it wasn't easy. Uh, and these are the women that did those things. You know, of course, we could do a series like this about many groups that are underrepresented in the media. And in the future, we will. But again, you got to start somewhere. And this is where we started. That's WGLT Digital Content Director Ryan Denham, who, along with the rest of the WGLT newsroom, is working on this new WGLT series called 21 Women Who Shaped Bloomington Normal. Ryan, thanks for coming in on Sound Ideas today. Sure thing, John. And you can follow the series at WGLT.org slash 21 women. And a special thanks to our partners at the McLean County Museum of History. That's for their help with the series. Museum staff provided many nominations and multimedia like archival audio and photos.
This is WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. I'm John Norton. The McLean County Arts Center kicks off its amateur exhibition tonight as part of downtown Bloomington's First Friday happenings. The show has been an annual tradition for nearly 100 years, giving advocational artists from all age groups and medium a chance to display their work in the Arts Center's Brandt Gallery. Retired Heartland Community College professor Tom Clemens is one of those artists he was selected from hundreds of submissions to show his painting called Trout Stream. Clemens tells WGLT's Lauren Warnicke he first started painting in the mid-1970s. We lived in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and I took up Norwegian rose mauling, which is a folk painting style, and I wanted to, to gravitate towards Swedish because that's part of my background. But there, was, there weren't any Swedish teachers at the time, so I took Norwegian there, and I painted about 10 years. And then because of family and a new house and job, I just kind of put that on the back burner. And then in 2012, I saw an advertisement for a Swedish class, a Swedish-style painting class, folk painting, in Decorah, Iowa, at the um, Folk Arts Center there, uh, attached to... Westerheim Museum, which is the Norwegian American Museum there. So I took the class and I took her class every year thereafter because that was the first time they offered Swedish, which was a political battle between offering a Swedish class in a Norwegian facility. But Wait, can you say a little bit more about that? Let's, <laughs> let's hold on a second. <laughs> well, <laughs> I always imagine the Scandinavians are very friendly with one another. But <laughs> Yeah, nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> I took the class and I, I repeated it, uh, not the same class, but different instructors every year until uh, COVID struck. <clears throat> By that time, I had also picked up on online Swedish language classes because one of the things I wanted to do was to paint these larger panels with a uh, proverb from a Swedish proverb and then interpret that into a scene. So I really got into it as a hobby. And I would give away whatever I had painted because Diane reinforced the idea I couldn't keep everything. The last couple of years, I decided to try some landscapes. And I did that using Norwegian or Swedish scene. <laughs> scene. <laughs> but uh, the, the painting I put into the contest now is, uh, I call it um, Trout Stream. And it's based on a photo I took in Iowa of a trout stream. I want to, I want to pause there because I, I want to ask you more specifically about color because I, I don't know a lot about Swedish painting or the differences between <laughs> Swedish and Norwegian painting. I will admit, um, but I understand that there is a particular palette that you work with that is part of this technique, right? Can yeah. you say a little more about that? Well, when I paint in Scandinavian style, there's certain accepted colors for the tr to match the tradition. Of course, there are always people pushing the boundaries on that. Um, and, that, and that's part of the fun of it, of course, creating, not just doing the same old thing. For me, the main thing in art, of course, with color is light, how light hits it. And that's why you, the, the color is nuanced, is because what our brain sees and what our eyes sees are two different things. It sounds like it's such a playful space for you. So at what point do you say to yourself, ah, that's it. That's it. You know, I did that or this painting is finished. You mm -hmm. know, how do you find these things into completion? Okay. Well, I'm going to compare it to what Stephen Spender said about poetry. You never finish a poem. You merely abandon it. it it's just combining those colors in ways that produce the object as the eye sees it. And that's the challenge to figure out. There's not a, a strict guide to that. You right. have to figure it out based on the picture I'm looking at. So. What motivated you to submit Trout Stream into the exhibition? <laughs> I mean, you mentioned the, the imperative from your wife to not have so much inventory in the house. <laughs> but, uh, you know, why put yourself into the exhibition and why that landscape in particular? If the word amateur hadn't been in it, I wouldn't have probably bothered. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, it'd be nice to get some feedback on what I'm doing. And I had this trout stream painting, which I was still working on. I've been working on it for months to get the colors. So I'm working with trees, shadow, the, the stream itself. And I knew I had to figure out water. <laughs> uh, how do you make water look like water? And in this particular painting of the trout stream, 
I have the calm water on the side, the eddies, and then the idea of the current. Uh, so you, you just can't paint a blue stream and say, oh, this is a stream. It wouldn't look like anything like the stream. So it's, again, it's the play of light. How do I get the light? And that's, I think I probably worked on this painting almost every day for five months. When I saw the deadline for the contest, I said, you know, I'm just about done with this. And if I get this done by next week, I'm going to put it in there just to see what the judge would say about what I'm doing with light on water. And so, so, so far, all is good that way. Yeah. Uh, you started to get into this a little bit, but I, I want to pull the thread a little bit harder on what painting gives you. I'm hearing certainly an exploration of your heritage, of your cultural background. And apparently you are you and your wife are proof that Norwegians and Swedes can actually live together. <laughs> yeah, it's called a mixed marriage. Yeah. <laughs> from where we come from up in North Dakota. Yeah. Uh, it's a mixed marriage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's your hobby, but it sounds like it's, it's maybe deeper than that. You're really interested in studying, in playing, in massaging that canvas and, and producing something. So yeah. what does it give you? It gives me a different way of looking at the world. What it gives me is a sense of, of a connection to what's around me, to nature and to uh, life. And I think the more we see the beauty in the world and maybe the beauty and the ugliness that we can learn to appreciate what side we want to be on. <laughs> um, in terms of um, living every day with a sense of awe and living every day with a sense of wonder and exploration and not thinking that I just know everything I need to know. I always can learn something new that gives me the spark to keep on looking and living and breathing and interacting with people and with nature itself and all the little microcosms of nature that I see around me. Before retiring from Heartland Community College, Clemens moved from the English department into an administrative role evaluating teachers. He snuck in some art training in the process by observing painting classes. Clemens now has a studio set up in his home so he can paint every day. He is 74 and says he'll keep doing it as long as his eyes and hands let him. Tom Clemens spoke with WGLT's Lauren Warnicke. Support for arts and culture coverage on WGLT comes from PNC Financial Services. PNC is committed to supporting local arts and culture events in the communities they serve. And that's Sound Ideas today. WGLT's news magazine is made possible in part by Bloomington Normal Audiology. I'm John Norton. Thanks to Charlie Schlenker and Lauren Warnicke for their stories today. And to Ryan Denham for stopping into the studio today to talk about our new series called 21 Women who shaped Bloomington Normal. Ryan Tui edits Sound Ideas. This is 89.1 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR Network.